and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Misery Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Wednesday, August 23rd, we're studying Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. In today's text, Solomon points out our limited human knowledge concerning what will happen to us in this life under the sun. And he also reminds us of our need to keep God's work and judgment in view. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us Pastor Ian Kenny. Pastor Kenny serves at First Lutheran Church in Sabatha, Kansas. Pastor Kenny, welcome to Sharper Iron. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a joy to have you with us today, Pastor. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 11 today. Help us with context within the book of Ecclesiastes. So not too long of a book, so anything about the book itself or what Solomon has been writing leading up to this text that'll help us look at chapter 11 today. Sure. So I think the best part for us to think about uh, Ecclesiastes 11 is the fact that it is uh, pretty much the closing thoughts of Solomon in the book um, with just one chapter left to go. Chapter 12 kind of sums everything up, um, really gives the thesis of the book right at the very, very end, uh, gives the meaning of life itself at the end of chapter 12, um, that, that there's nothing else under the sun that matters but to fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man, Solomon says. So uh, chapter 12 is kind of a, a postlude or a postscript um, on the book, I think. And so chapter 11 kind of acts, I think, as some of his concluding thoughts prior to that. And like you said, it's, it, it, it covers a lot, about, a lot about humility, a lot about what it takes to be humble and submit to the will of God, which means not being obsessed about, um, not being too obsessed about the times and seasons and days and years that we have, unless, as we'll see next chapter, unless they are for the good of um, fearing God and keeping his commandments. What are some of those themes within the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon has laid out that tie into what we're going to read today in chapter 11? Yeah, part of it is, is uh, his, his overarching theme of vanity of vanities and all is vanity, like you guys uh, first started talking about when you, when you opened the book up, um, that all is vanity, all is chasing after wind. Um, and I think that certainly has to be kept in mind with, with again, the way he ends this book, that everything... He says everything is chasing after wind. And I think his, his main point there is that everything is chasing after wind um, if it doesn't help fear God and keep his commandments. So there is the vanity of vanities. There is uh, his, his comment that there is nothing new under the sun. And so what is, what is not new under the sun is that what he, I think what he brings up quite a bit today is that you, you do not know what the future holds except for the fact that the Lord promises to be there and be faithful. And there's nothing new under the sun with that. Mm -hmm. um, another one of his big themes with nothing new under the sun uh, is that there's also nothing new under the sun with the sin of man, the sin of greed, the sin of uh, materialism. Um, looking at Solomon's life and, and uh, you know, he was gifted with so much. He was gifted with wealth and prosperity. Uh, I mean, the only thing in the world he was missing was, was air conditioning. Um, and who knows, he might have even figured that out. But he had everything under the sun and all of his wealth and all of his prosperity. It only led him into despair. It only led him into sin. And, 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 and it even tells us in Scripture that all of his wives and all of his, all of his big riches were in fact what led him away from the Word of God. Um, and so whether it is the 21st century or whether it is Solomon, uh, the, the, nothing, nothing new under the sun. We are obsessed with stuff. We are obsessed with materialism. Um, and so Solomon, uh, he, he speaks quite a bit, I think quite a bit more about money in Proverbs than he does in Ecclesiastes. Um, 
But nevertheless, he does speak today about not being obsessed with money. Um, he he calls it he yep. calls it he calls it bread, um, and and give a portion to your bread to seven or even to eight, um, because you really don't know what's going to happen. And so one of the things he brings in for us is is a reminder of Christian discipline that one way to fight against greed and materialism and just <laughs> an obsession with things in this life um, is generosity and kindness and tithing and almsgiving. Mm. Um, finally, again, with, with his themes throughout the book, what comes up again today in some of his final thoughts is, is a submission to the will of God. Uh, he brings up in, in verse, uh, he brings up in verse uh, 8 and 9 today, uh, maybe 10 as well, about the resurrection of all flesh and his faith therein. Um, and so I think what he's bringing out is, is this idea that we are called to live an eternal life that doesn't just begin in a casket, but we're called to live an eternal life that began uh, in a font. Hmm. All right, very good. So with those thoughts in mind, we're going to take a look now at the text of Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Solomon writes, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with a child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. That's our text for today. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. All right, Pastor Kenny, in that first verse, Solomon says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. What does that mean, to cast our bread upon the waters? Yeah, cast your bread, cast your grain upon the waters, and then he follows up in verse 2, give a portion of that bread, of that grain, to seven or even eight, because you don't know what disaster might happen on the earth. Um, as he does throughout all of Ecclesiastes, as he does throughout all of Proverbs, um, as he does in the, in, the whole book of, in the whole book of Song of Songs, um, Solomon is, is speaking in, these, in this, wonderful, uh, this wonderful poetry, uh, these kind of um, two-sided sentences of, of one thing and then its conclusion or its follow-up or its, or its succession. So in this, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Um, what, he, what he's saying there is, is, again, not to be obsessed with the things of this life. Um, Jesus speaks about this so often um, that you are so obsessed with the things of this life and, and you, you, you think God has forgotten about you? You think, you think God doesn't you know, take some time every day to go through all of your hairs and count them because of how much he just loves you? Um, Jesus says, you know, you, you're, you know that uh, red sky at night, you know, uh, uh, sailors are light, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning, um, but you don't know the signs and seasons of the Son of Man. So casting your bread upon the waters and then giving it away um, is, just this, is just this beautiful way of saying, stop being so obsessed with the things of this life. For you'll find it after many days, and you don't know what disaster will happen upon the earth. And so what, he, what he's speaking about here is that one of the gifts that the scriptures give to fight against the sin of uh, materialism and greed is Christian charity. Uh, that Jesus speaks about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't say if you give or if you can give or if you want to give. He says when you give, this is how you do it. And so whether it is tithing in the congregation, whether it is almsgiving to your local poor, um, you are called as a Christian to give. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a command of Christ, but it is also the example of Christ, uh, that Jesus is the giver of all that is good. 
He is the only one who has given everything, given himself on the cross, given himself to you in water and word and in his body and blood. Um, and, and so you are, you are Christian and you are called to be like the Christ after whom you are named. So casting your bread upon the waters uh, is, is, is helping you not to be obsessed with all the things that you've been given because the things that God has given you are good. First article gifts are good, but when they become, uh, when they become worshipped rather than the creator who is blessed forever, we have a mixed order of operations there. So talk about how that image works. I mean, I, I'm with you that, that we're seeing the idea of generosity, but casting bread upon the waters, how does, how does that image communicate generosity? Is the idea that just go ahead and, and give freely? I mean, it seems silly to throw bread on water. How does that image work yeah, it does. to communicate generosity? It does. So I think, in, especially in verse 2, is when it comes up with generosity as specifically giving to someone. Uh, when it comes up in verse 1, um, I think that first half of the sentence, cast your bread upon the waters, uh, is for your own good. Um, the generosity comes up in verse 2, but it is for your own good to not be so obsessed with the things of this life. So yeah, if you think about it, you know, the sower goes out to sow and, and sows his grain, and, and then it comes to a harvest of 100 or 60 or 30 fold, and he does all the work of, of harvesting it uh, and, and, and threshing it. Uh, and, and instead of going and taking it in and, and making himself a sandwich, he takes it, the grain or, or the bread itself, and, and just throws it on the water. Um, and so I think it's Solomon's poetic way of, of speaking again of all this vanity or vapor chasing after wind. That if you're obsessed with the things of this life, um, that needs to be curbed. By, by the word of God and, and by the sacraments of Christ. So, yeah, you think about how hard it would, how hard it would be um, to actually uh, live a truly agrarian lifestyle, work so hard for this bread, this grain, and then just throw it out into the water. But what he says afterwards is also interesting. And, and what, this is what Jesus says about almsgiving and tithing as well. He says, you'll find it after many days. Um, that you throw, you think about throwing your bread out on a lake or out in the ocean, um, it might drift out to sea, but but most likely the eventually the waves are going to carry it back into you. So Jesus speaks this way about the dead in in the book of Revelation, that from now on he says, "Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, because their good works their, their good works will follow them." Um, he speaks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, that if you give in Christian charity and love, he says, if you do it just to impress other people. He says, then you've received your reward, your reward and your greed. But if you do it in Christian love and charity, he said, the father who sees in secret will reward you. Uh, and of course, the reward that we always have is, is, is the uh, eternal love of God and the sacrifice of Christ. But yeah, it's a very, it's a very uh, deep and beautiful image of all the things you've worked for in, this, in, this, uh, in these wheat berries, right? In these grain of bread. And you just throw it away. But but because we're throwing it away in the way that, that the Lord has commanded, giving to support the church, as you said, giving to serve our neighbor who is in need, then there actually is a, a return. It, it's maybe not what we thought it would be, but there is a return. I mean, think of, I guess, in other places, the words of Jesus that Paul quotes in Acts chapter 20. I mean, just very simply, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, which is the opposite of what we think. Yeah. But but here, Solomon echoes that that same language. So there, okay, so verse one then describes perhaps the blessing that we receive in, in giving. There, there's a blessing for us. It's good for us to give. And then I think you said in verse two, that describes more the, the good that it is for our neighbor to re, for us to be giving and genera, generous. Talk about that. Right, so this is kind of the question of why does God give first article gifts? Um, why does God give us house and home and, and, and clothing and shoes and food and drink and all that we have? Why does God give us this stuff? He gives us this stuff so we can give it to other people. He gives us this stuff so, as Solomon says, we can fear God and keep his commandments. He gives us this stuff so we can love and serve God and neighbor. He gives us our stuff for other people. And so this is, this is why the seventh commandment exists. The seventh commandment uh, is that you shall not steal. And the reason that 
one of the many reasons it's wrong to steal from somebody is that you steal from them the opportunity to give to you. Hmm. So you steal from someone the opportunity to show you love and kindness when you take their stuff. Whereas instead, you know, as God says to David, if you would have just asked me, I would have given you more stuff. And so, yeah, it's this beautiful thing that you don't know what disaster will happen on the earth, right? Maybe the, maybe the famine will come. Maybe we'll have seven years. We'll have seven fat years or seven lean years. You just don't know. And you can't make one hair white or black. But you, knew, you do know that God has given you these people that you look up and see to love and serve and give glory to him. So sure, give your portion to seven, the perfect number. Or even, you know what, why not? Not even seven, give it, give it to eight. Uh, give it to even more than the perfect number. Uh, for you do not know what will happen. And so the goods that you have, all these first article gifts, they are given to you by the creator. They are given to you by your father for the purpose of your neighbor. Hmm. Yeah, well, and so we don't know what disaster will happen, whether it is to us or to the neighbor. You know, I mean, I think of the way Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount concerning worry that we, we and you, you've referenced it already here in this conversation. You know, we, we think that we need to hold on to all these things because of whatever disaster may come to us. And, and here, the fact that we don't know the disaster that's going to come to us, that's actually the very reason that we should give it away because we don't know how to protect ourselves from disaster. And we also don't know, maybe our neighbor needs it as well. And so I can give it to him right. for the disaster that might come his way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very interesting thinking about the way that God works through means um, that that God God feeds the child uh, through the child's mother. Right. God provides for that child's mother through the child's father. God allows for the father to provide through the businessman. The businessman has a job because you go buy stuff. Well, hold back to stuff again. Right. Um, so God was always providing for us through means of stuff. And, and you are the means that God has given to serve your neighbor. So if you think about it with, um, with Job, um, jo Job has mm. these three friends show up to him, uh, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. And what's, what's interesting with them is that all of these friends are just a bunch of bums. Um, they have no good advice for him. Uh, we know that they're not believers. They have no Christian names. They are not his friends. But um, one last friend, friend does come whose name is Elihu, which is a biblical Christian name. This friend comes and tells him um, the word of the Lord. He says, he says, yeah, your life is pretty terrible and I don't know why, but I know that the Lord is good and I know that he will be faithful. And so whether it is with kind words of a Christian, uh, whether it is with uh, rebuking someone for sin, whether it is for um, uh, helping a father provide for his family, whatever it might be, you are the means that God has chosen to, to help your neighbor. Hmm. So go ahead and do that. That fights against your flesh. That helps your neighbor be generous. Cast your bread upon the waters. Give a portion to seven or even to eight. Be generous. This is what God commends to us, what Solomon gives to us here at the beginning of Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Now, in, into verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. How, what's Solomon saying there? Is that related? Is he moving to a different topic? What, what's going on in verse 3? Uh, I, think, I, think, I think all of chapter 11 are his closing thoughts. And so I think he's kind of summing himself up. So it is kind of in the same vein of um, no longer necessarily in charity and, and the giving of the other. Uh, but now we're kind of moving in a little bit to... Um, the submission to the will of God as far as your present life and, as Paul says, the things to come. And so as, as Paul says in, in Romans, right, I am sure that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come can, uh, can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So he's kind of starting a little bit of a new section. Um, and what he's, what he's saying is kind of, we kind of have a colloquialism for it now a little bit with that second part of verse 3. Um, you know, if, uh, if a tree falls in the woods and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Yes, it does, because you're not the center of the universe. And <laughs> so if you're not you there to hear the sound, question. the sound still takes place. <laughs> that is the answer. The chicken came before the egg, and if the tree falls and you're not there, 
and it still makes a sound. It's all very simple. So the point is that you're not the center of the universe. Um, and what he says in the next verse, he says, you can stare at these things until you're blue in the face, the wind um, or, or the clouds, but it's not going to change anything. So he's kind of moving into this new section here, um, starting off with this beautiful language. It shows up in it shows up in Psalm 8. It shows up in Psalm 19 uh, about the heavens declaring the glory of God and the sky above proclaiming his handiwork, that God has ordered the universe in a wonderful way. Sometimes, like in Romans 1 and 2, we uh, um, big thinkers with big words talk about it as, as natural law. Um, but it is the fact that God has ordered the universe in a wonderful way. Uh, we know from Psalm 139 that the Lord has knit you together in his in your mother's womb and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, so also the Lord has ordered the universe in the same way. And when when we submit to the will of God, when we submit to God's order, whether that is in life or in faith or in marriage or in family or in gender or whatever this is, when we submit to God's order, knowing that if we try to change it, it's only going to be a mess. Uh, when we submit to God's order, uh, as he says in a few verses, no matter what happens, he says in verse six, it's all going to be good. But, you know, if we, just because we can go against our nature, um, which if any, very few of God's creation can go against their nature, we can, and we do all the time. Um, you know, we, for example, uh, we, we can disrupt the natural order. Um, you know, I, I, I bet, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, um, even though I might play one on TV. I'm not a scientist, um, but I bet that if we put nuclear rockets on the side of the moon, I bet we can move it. I bet we can move it really close to the sun just to see what happens. Um, now, I think that, you know, that would not be good at all, but we can disrupt the natural order. We should not. The Lord has ordered the universe in a wonderful way, and you're not the center of it. Christ and his cross is. Mm -hmm. So if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. You're not going to be able to stop that. If a tree falls to the north or the south, where it falls is where it falls. And the sound it makes is what it makes. And as he says, there is nothing new under the sun. So this joy that the Lord gives in receiving what he gives um, and, and taking what he offers, um, knowing that uh, as we pray in the church, that we receive from the Lord both our sorrows as well as our joys. So I'm not the center of the universe. I'm not going to stop the clouds full of rain from dropping that water on the earth, nor am I going to stop that tree from falling and making the sound. How does verse 4 fit into that? He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Right, so we have this idea of um, observing the wind and, and regarding the clouds. And so he just talked about, you know, it's going to be the wind that's probably going to push a tree down. Uh, it's going to be uh, the clouds that are going to bring forth rain. And so uh, observing this wind and, and regarding these clouds, um, you know, you can, you can stare and stare at these things until you are blue in the face um, and you are, you're not going to change any of it. Um, so when he talks about this, this, this word he uses there, observe, it also has a connotation of kind of like guarding and keeping it um, uh, with the wind. Uh, and then this word that he used when it comes mm. to the clouds, this regarding the clouds, it's, I mean, it's, it's perceiving it, it's looking in deeply to it. Um, instead of rejoicing in what the Lord is doing, instead of rejoicing that God has given us these, these four seasons, as long as you live, you know, in most parts of the world, you receive these four seasons of God. Um, you receive the wind. You receive the rain in its due season. Um, and this is a joy. But, but to try to fight against that or be mad about that is just vanity. And it does not serve in the fearing of God or the keeping of his commandments. So again, Jesus says, uh, you obsess over all these things. But look, guys, you can't even make one hair white or black. Um, so if you obsess over the times mm. and not obsess over the good <clears throat> that you are given to give and receive in the times, you're completely going to miss the point. Mm. 
So, and then the matter of, of not sowing, not reaping, it, the, the way that I'm, I'm hearing this image then is that if, I, if I'm sitting there, I'm the farmer, and I'm watching the wind waiting for just the right moment, thinking that I can figure it out, or I'm watching the clouds thinking for just the right moment when I'm going to reap and thinking I can figure it out, if, if all I'm doing is, is observing regarding, I'm never actually going to end up doing anything, it seems. Right. Right. Yeah, paralysis by analysis. Um, that if, if you wait until you can control the situation or that it's going to be just right, um, or that you, you don't like the cards that you've been dealt and you just, you just stare at the situation, um, you will not reap. So if you are just mad about the fact that things are the way they are, but, um, your bed's not made and your children aren't fed and your bills aren't paid, God has given you very simple and clear ways to love your neighbor. Very, I mean, they're not easy. They're simple, but they're not easy. Um, so if you just peer into the depths of all these things and you, you, you get paralysis by analysis, you'll always miss the joy of the Christian life. You'll always miss uh, how much beauty this eternal life that we have has to offer. Um, and you'll, you'll, mm. you'll, 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 you will despise the word of God. You will neglect his sacraments um, if, if, you're, if you're only obsessed over the things that you cannot control. Mm. And Solomon would have us understand that God is the one in control so that we might remain humble before him and yield to him and to his will for our lives. We're going to keep looking at this text from Ecclesiastes chapter 11. More on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Ian Kenny this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that an investment with Lutheran Church Extension Fund exclusively supports LCMS ministries and church workers? That's right. LCEF ensures LCMS churches, schools, and organizations have access to the financial resources they need to sustain, strengthen, and start ministry work. In other words, you can feel good investing with LCEF because we share your Lutheran values and love for the church. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, August 23rd. We're studying Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 to 10 with Pastor Ian Kenny. He serves at First Lutheran Church in Sabatha, Kansas. Pastor Kenny, prior to the break, we left off after verse 4. So moving now into verse 5 of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, Solomon says, As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. It sounds like we've got more humility in the, in the knowledge of who God is and the recognition that we just don't know everything. Uh, tell us what Solomon is saying here in verse 5. Yeah, so Solomon, uh, he kind of mocks the person uh, who wants to be God, and he says, look, this, this event happens every single day. The conception of a child happens, happens every day, and you can't even figure out how that works. And we'll talk about uh, modern lies that we think we do in a moment, but um, you can't even figure out how that works, much less the God who makes everything. You know, as he says elsewhere, you know, consider the ant, my brother, the ant who works all day, and you're just a sluggard who lies around in bed. You can't even figure out how to be more like the ant. So it's really a humbling experience when you, when you, when you behold the beauty of God. And so he speaks about this concept, this, uh, this miracle of, of conception. Uh, when a child is conceived, uh, and, and already, though, though microscopic, that this, this is a child, this is a boy or a girl made in the image of likeness of God, redeemed by the death of Christ, who, will, who has an eternal soul and will be raised on the last day. And you don't have any idea how that works. So now in the, in the modern age, uh, we're convinced that, uh, that, that we are smart because we understand science, but we are still, we are still figuring these things out every day. It was just a few years ago. Uh, it, it was just in very recent memory when, 
when we were able to witness um, hyper microscopically the conception take place. And it was all over the news that this miracle of when a child is conceived um, before, before implantation, before the first trimester, before labor and delivery, when this child is conceived, that there's this explosion of light. I mean, we're, th we're 3,000 years past Solomon, and we just got that. So we need to calm down that some of these things don't apply to us because we're modern people. We still don't have any idea how this stuff takes place. It's an absolute miracle. And so if we can understand these things that happen every single day, the fact that if, what is it, if the sun was this or that, closer or farther, we'd fry or freeze. Um, we don't understand all these things uh, of the glory that God has given us. Um, how humbling it is that we do not know the work of God who makes everything. So what we do know, uh, we do know that we'll talk about this a little bit later. What we do know is that God uh, is working all things for our good, as we see in the next verse, that no matter what happens, um, tribulation, tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors because Christ loves us. So again, a big theme in this chapter of Solomon uh, is humility, that if you know nothing else in the world, you should know that there is a God and you're not him. And that's the best news in the world, besides the fact that he died for you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What, what wonderful simplicity and yet such an important thing to keep in mind. There is a God, not you. That's, and that's a, a huge thing for Solomon in this book and in this chapter especially. So as you said, now we move into verse six. So in the morning, sow your seed and at evening withhold not your hand for you do not know which will prosper this or that or whether both alike will be good. So here's more emphasis on what you do not know, but you said there are some things we, we can know from this verse, Pastor Kenny. Uh, what's there in verse six for us? Yeah, so I think um, six, seven, and eight kind of all run a little bit together. Um, but what we have, I think, that's really, really nice here uh, is that this this verse in six, and then especially in eight, um, it, really, uh, it really lends itself uh, to the table prayers that we pray in the catechism. Um, the psalm that Luther has given us before each table prayer, um, and then as well the, the prayer that he has given us as well, um, that we give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. The Lord, uh, uh, he does not take pleasure in the strength of the horse or the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and in those who hope in his steadfast love. So in the morning, sow your seed, and at evening, get your work done. Um, because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you don't know when the Lord is going to return. And if anyone tells you they do, they're trying to sell you something. You don't know when the Lord is coming back. You don't know either when the Lord is coming on the last day or when the Lord is coming on your last day. Either way, when you open your eyes, you're going to see Jesus afterwards. You don't know what's going to happen, but you do know that no matter when the end comes, or when your end comes, you know that as a Christian, your marching orders that Solomon says in the next chapter, they don't change. Whether the Lord comes tomorrow or whether the Lord comes in a thousand years, guess what, buddy? You still get to fear God and keep his commandments. You still get to be loved by God and receive the grace of Christ and him crucified. So verse six, I mean, it sounds so colloquial that it shouldn't be in the Bible, but it's all going to be good. I mean, he says it right there at the end of the verse. Whether, whether both alike will be good, no matter what happens, the Lord is working all things for the good of you who love him because you have been called according to his purpose and that his purpose for your life, his meaning for your life is that you be saved. His meaning for life is that you would have faith in Christ, receive the forgiveness of your sins, receive the body and blood of God on your tongue and, and die a blessed death that your works might follow you. So this is the real beauty of the Christian life. Um, do the work that you've been given to do while it is day because the night is coming uh, when no one can work. Um, you don't know what's going to happen, but you know that you are given to love and serve God and neighbor. So this beauty of joy that we have in the Christian life is that, like we said, we pray in the church that we receive from the Lord our sorrows as well as our joys, knowing that he is working all things for our good, uh, whether in uh, whether in riches or in poverty, whether in health 
and sickness. And every person who has been married in the rites and in the liturgy of the church has, has vowed to expect these things to happen in health and in sickness, in riches and in poverty. These are what you vow to your husband or your wife uh, when you marry your spouse. Uh, because you know that all these things will come. And like Elihu said to Job, I don't know why. I mean, there are, there are a lot of reasons the Bible gives us on why bad things happen. And, and there's plenty to talk about there. But the hope that we have is that whatever it is, it is for the good. The Lord promises that. Now, you said that verses 7 and 8 go together with that thought found in verse 6. How do verses 7 and 8 build on that and further explain what Solomon's been saying? Yeah, so they certainly do. So in 7, um, you know, he says, uh, in the morning sow your seed, or in verse 6, he says, in the morning sow your seed, at evening don't withhold your hand. And then in 7, he says, light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So, so remember one of his refrains, one of his antiphons throughout this book is that there is nothing new under the sun. And then verse 8, no matter how many years you have under the sun, um, if you never see the sun because you die in your mother's womb, uh, if you live for uh, 70 or by reason of strength, 80 years, um, rejoice in the Lord. But, but remember uh, that, that either way, the night is coming when no one can work. And anything that does not lend itself to the fear of God and the keeping of his commandments, the Bible is very clear. It's vanity. Uh, these first article gifts that are so wonderful, Solomon knew it full well. And, and here at the end of his life, he's writing this book. He's just about to close it up. And he's just looking back on all that he had. And it's just chasing after wind um, that we get so... We get so obsessed about all the big things. We get so obsessed about all the things over there. And, and we forget that there is a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter or a pastor or a layman that desperately needs God to love them through us. Um, they desperately need us uh, because that is, uh, we are the ones for whom uh, Christ has given. So Christ has given us to serve them. And if we're so obsessed with everything else, we, we, really, we really miss what's in front of us. Um, so all will be good. Mm -hmm. In verse 8, uh, if, if you live for many years, rejoice. But remember that darkness is coming, uh, that, that death comes for us all, and that Christ has conquered death. Um, and if you don't fear that God who has conquered death, if you don't keep his commandments in, in loving him and your neighbor, everything else is vanity. Mm. Those in verse eight, those two things that Solomon gives, both to rejoice in however many years you have, but also to remember the days of darkness will be coming. Those two verbs, rejoicing and remembering, seem pretty, seem pretty key there in that verse. What happens if we don't do one or the other? If we don't rejoice in the years that we have, why is that bad? And if we don't remember that the days of darkness are coming, why is that bad? Okay, so when verse eight talks about rejoicing and remembering, rejoicing uh, in the good years and remembering that there will be darkness. Uh, we can think about this a few different places in the Bible. Uh, we can think about this with Old Testament Joseph, for example, that Joseph is given seven fat years as well as seven lean years. Now, both of these come from the Lord. Um, both of these are promised by the Lord. And and, of course, all works for the good, and, and that's one of the places in the Bible we actually see why bad things happen, um, is that, uh, you know, someone might have meant this for evil, but the Lord used it for good. So, the point with Joseph is that there will always be fat years, there will always be lean years, and it's always the case that we don't rejoice in the fat years, we don't remember that, that lean years are coming. So in, in the fat years, we never prepare for the lean years. Um, in the lean years, we, we, never, we never rejoice that fat years are coming. Um, we just kind of wallow in, in sadness of what we don't have. And so when it comes to this rejoicing, remembering, uh, it is the fact that no matter what comes, good or bad, uh, wealth or, or poverty, health or sickness, um, 
All things come from the Father's hand. And again, like we pray in the prayers, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Mm -hmm. um, so we see this with Joseph. Um, what we also see is that, you know, he kind of leads into nine as well. Uh, if we want to get into that, he leads into nine as well. Um, because he, he contrasts in verse eight, he contrasts an old man with a young man. And so this is the, this is the gift of, of long years. What Solomon will often say, gray hair, that it is the crown of the old um, and a blessed death, uh, not an evil death, um, but a blessed death. And that doesn't even mean a, a short and painless death, but but a blessed death. And so the, the reason that long years, long life and gray hair are a blessing uh, that he says in verse eight to rejoice um, is because you have more time to repent. <laughs> you, have, you have more time to repent of sins. You have the gray hair of wisdom because ideally, uh, if you're 80 years old, then you've been reading the Bible for 75 years and, and hearing it for, for over 80 years. And so there is rejoicing in that. And, and a blessed death is one where you can die well, having lived a life of, of repentance and passing that faith down to those below you. So rejoicing in the years, remembering days of darkness, um, the, both these things Solomon holds in tension. All right. So as he holds those in tension, then he moves into verse 9, which you've started to, to bring out. He says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. There's plenty to talk about in that verse, Pastor Kenny. Help us to see what Solomon's saying. Yeah, so it's funny sometimes when the Bible is sarcastic. And I, I think that this one is one of those times. Um, there's a few times in, in the New Testament where even Jesus, even our Lord, uh, has, some, has some sarcastic humor in places. And I think right here is one of the places we're dealing with them. Um, that if you can see the Lord's tongue in his cheek and saying, sure, young man, rejoice in your youth. Let your heart cheer. Do whatever you want. Eat, drink, and be merry because, yeah, tomorrow you're going to die. Just know, <laughs> just know this will bring judgment upon you. So I think what we're dealing with here um, is, that, is that we're dealing with a little bit of, of rhetoric. We're dealing with a little bit of um, confusion before clarity. That, yeah, if you want to rejoice in your youth, um, follow the sins of your youth, uh, of which the saints always repent of. Um, just take cheer in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. That's fine. But the Lord will bring you into judgment. Uh, this is a hard word. Um, few can receive it. But this is... One of the only places, if not the only place, the Bible says, follow your heart. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. follow your heart. That's, I mean, if, if this were graduation season, that's what you hear at graduation speeches. So talk to us what, what Solomon does and doesn't mean here so that we don't misunderstand what he, what he says. Yeah, so again, I think he's using some rhetoric. He's using forms of speech to draw us into a situation like a, like a, like a, like a bait and switch um, with his words and then pulling us out and say, but if you do that, you will be judged. So I believe it's the only place, um, but, but it is at least one of the few places where the Bible says, follow your heart. And the result of that is judgment. Your heart is a disaster. Your heart only once sin. And, and, and if you're Christian, you, you have a regenerate heart and you do cooperate with the spirit and you, sh you should do good works as the Lord commands you to do by the grace of the Holy Spirit. But that old man uh, is always dragging you down. That old Adam is dragging you down, um, even though you're trying to walk according to the desires of the spirit. So if you have kids or if you know kids or if you've ever seen a kid, uh, if a child uh, you give a child a piggyback ride and the kid gets on your back. The first thing the kid does is start to choke you, right? Throws his arms around your necks and he's just trying to hang on, but he's trying to choke you. This is what the old Adam does. Uh, the old Adam just chokes us and, and drags us down. So what he's saying here is that if you want to follow your heart, 
God's never going to force you to love him. If you want to walk in the sight of your own eyes, God's not going to kidnap you. But know that if you do these things, if you follow your heart and not Jesus's heart that is pierced for you, um, it, the Bible just says here that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So do not insist upon your own ways. Um, and this, this is the threat of youth. Um, the devil always has temptations for us that are custom fit and tailor made to who we are whether it's how much money we have or uh, if we're male or female uh, or here if we're young or old. So when it comes to the, when it comes to the old, uh, there is the threat of the sin of apathy and pride. But when it comes to youth, um, this is why we desire length of days, to repent of sins of youth. Youth is a joy. Uh, there is the strength and energy that comes with youth, and that's great because you wake up every day and your back doesn't hurt. And, uh, you know, you, you can look any way you want, turn your head any way, and your neck doesn't pop and feel like you died for a little bit. Uh, youth is great, but it is also a liability. Um, we pray that God would forgive us the sins of our youth because youth is a liability. Because virtue and wisdom just have not had time to shape. And so this is, this is, this is a, a, a note to Christian parents on why it's so important to train up your child in a way he should go so that when he's old, he won't depart from it. So, young man, um, rejoice in the Lord and know that your youth is a liability and keep your eyes from worthless things. Um, because, because to just insist on the things of your own heart uh, is the quickest way to perdition. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and I know this goes beyond the text that we've got for our discussion today, but keeping in mind what Solomon says in 12 verse 1 about remembering your creator in the days of your youth helps us to un understand what he is and isn't saying as well when it comes to following the ways of your heart. And, and as you were saying, when it comes to the way the Bible speaks of the heart, the only other place that I can, I can think of, at least off the top of my head, where maybe there's some, some positive connotations is in Psalm 37, verse 4, where, where the psalmist, it's David there, says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But I've always, I've always noted there that the desires of your heart come after you've already del delighted yourself in the Lord. So when you delight yourself in the Lord, he transforms your heart so that you delight in the right things and you desire the right things. And perhaps we can keep all of that in mind, again, as we think about what Solomon's saying here. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, the Lord says very clearly in Ezekiel, um, calling the people to repentance and promising to pour out his, his spirit upon them. He says, I will take their heart of stone and I will give them a heart of flesh. So, so yes, after we rejoice in the will of the Lord, after we desire that his name would be hallowed, his kingdom would come and his will would be done uh, and bring earth down to heaven, um, then, again, we do cooperate with the Spirit, as our confessions say. Uh, we, we, we do strive to want the things that God wants and love the things that God loves. But if it is just following the desires of our heart apart from what his word says, then we're in a little bit of trouble. Mm, that's right. That's right. So take us now into verse 10, Pastor Kenny. We've got about four minutes here on the morning. Verse 10 says, remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. What is Solomon saying there? Yeah. So I think what we're dealing with here, and I think we could think about these things as almost the close of the book with chapter 12 being like a postscript and kind of a running everything out. So Remove vexation from your heart, put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. And the dawn of life is vanity as well as youth, because is that if this life was all that there was, first Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, um, then we would be most of all to be pitied. Um, if this life was all that there was, then this life would not be worth living. Uh, but in fact, the Lord has made you for eternal things and your heart is never satisfied with anything less. So there is, there is the kind of 
hint here of the resurrection of the new body, a new youth, um, a new dawn of life in which we will live uh, with Christ and his eternal wounds and the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom forever. And until then, rejoice in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, um, but understand that you, you will receive uh, you will receive a resurrected body that you will get to live with Christ forever in eternity. Until then, um, be humble, rejoice in the Lord always, uh, and walk by faith and not by sight, knowing that no matter what comes, the Lord will be there and he will be faithful, and that you are called to fear God and keep his commandments in the meantime. We've got about two minutes here, Pastor Kenny. Plenty of things that we've talked about here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Help us to, to wrap things up, and especially to see how does this text point us to our Savior Jesus? Yeah, I was just going to say, to wrap everything up, it needs to be wrapped up in a nice, uh, nice cross-shaped bow. Um, that it is the fact that Christ is the one who is obedient and humble unto death, even death on the cross. Uh, that he is the one who has on the cross given up the ghost and poured out the spirit into your heart. Um, that the spirit is the one who intercedes with you with groanings too deep for words. Uh, that when you know not for what to pray as you ought, um, the Lord has given it to you in his word. He nourishes it in you in his sacrament um, and he breathes it into you in his Holy Spirit. And so, um, so the Lord has done all these things. And it, as the gospel says, the Lord has done all things well. And so you can trust in him. Um, that, that as many sins as you have, he has more grace. Uh, as, as much as you have to have forgiven, he never runs out of forgiveness. Um, but that you are called to still love the Lord your God with all of your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself, as, as the Savior himself has commanded you to do and has shown you how to do himself. Pastor Ian Kenny is pastor at First Lutheran Church in Sabetha, Kansas. He has been helping us today to study Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Pastor Kenny, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much for having me, and God be with you. There is so much that we do not know. We are dependent, limited human beings, and we do well to keep that spirit of humility in our hearts and minds, living in the fear of God, trusting in him, knowing that he will work both alike for our good. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Ecclesiastes chapter 11, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.